Well, thank you, Daniel. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks for everyone to uh, you know for welcoming me uh, in your homes. I hope you're comfortable, and uh, let's see what we can uh, what we can say in the coming hour on uh, on adiabatic uh, quantum transport. So, um, so I also have to get used to to this, but I think it's let let's go. So here's a, here's a little bit of a of the plan of uh, of the next hour um so i will start with well the first word of my title and say uh, a few words try to describe in, in simple words what uh, adiabatic and the adiabatic principle means and what it will mean at least in this talk uh, i call this a principle because you know there's there's various in a sense various technical versions of it you can make it into a theorem in various situations and i will also explain one but it's a it's also a general principle uh, uh, who's also that is also very intuitive uh, a, a notion which which goes with it so the adiabatic principle comes with a with a geometric picture and and a notion of parallel transport i will try to quickly describe it and and then relate it to to you know that this geometric mathematical object of parallel transport uh, is has a nice has a nice parallel precisely in in transporting also particle and transporting charge physically and uh, related to this i will i will present uh, an index uh, for charge transport an index just means an expression uh, of which we can show that it is quantized and we will see that there are situations where this quantization gives you an integer and sometimes it gives you a fraction so i'll describe that and then you know part of this um, is we talk we will be talking about charge transport and we'll see that uh, an important thing is to to understand how how charge fluctuates in, in a ground state of a physical system so i'll discuss that and uh, as a corollary of um of the proof actually it turns out that we understand a little bit how 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 some systems which have quantized charge transport exhibit elementary excitations that are anions. I'll, I'll come to this and describe, uh, for those of you who don't know what anions are, I'll also describe a little bit what they, what they are. So um, somebody was talking about having a beer. I would prefer, prefer to have a, a glass of wine, I guess. So let me explain this adiabatic principle uh, in equations, but also uh, using that little waiter there uh, and explain a little bit what, uh, what it is. So, so the adiabatic principle has to do with with time evolution and so we will be talking you know in my in my example i will be talking about the time evolution of that bottle of wine that is uh, standing there on the on top of the this plate that the waiter is holding so you see in general we'll just have a time evolution for physical quantity phi right and it's given like this and here i have i have a, a, an operator which doesn't need to be linear uh, so you, you can think here, so P for now, let's forget, let's ignore this. And we think of this as being simply the Newton's equation for that bottle, right? For the, for, the, for the time evolution of that bottle. And of course, the time evolution of that bottle will depend on, well, typically the angle of this plate, right? So in fact, there's more than just one time evolution for each position of the plate, right? So for each position of a plate, you, you have... A time evolution right so this is this and p is here the position of the plate so in general p you know it's more than one parameter um no we we should not so one question is whether we should think for now that h is finite dimensional so for now no and and you see again i'll, I'll tell here a bit vaguely i'll give later a more concrete setting but here i'll say vaguely and so I'll, I'll no no h here is a banach it's in general a banach space in this talk it will be a hilbert space but it doesn't need to be finite dimensional m is a manifold of parameters so so here you know it would be uh, it would be the upper half sphere for example which gives you the angle of that plate right and part of the adiabatic principle is that you have this evolution equation and you have also a family of fixed points. These are these phi p's, right? So these are, this, you know, the positions here, it's clearly, we, we, we also have an intuitive picture of what this is. This would be the position, you know, the standing position of that bottle perpendicular to the plate. And again, that depends on 
the value on the angle of the plate, so on the value of the parameter. Right, so this is part of the assumptions that you need to have to have an adiabatic principle, right? And once you have, you have that kind of setting, then what happens? Well, it is a waiter. So this, this guy is actually moving around, or at least was in the good old days where you could go to the restaurant, right? So he's moving around and therefore he's, he's moving this plate. So there is, there's, a, there's, a given, there's a given what we call, what I would like to call, oh, I didn't want to write this. Uh, I just wanted to have the spotlight. So there's a driving, right? So the, the, these parameters change in time right the, the the orientation of the plate may change in time so you can again solve this time evolution equation with now a time dependent parameter right and you imagine that you start the dynamics this is also important you start the dynamics in one of the fixed points right so the fixed points corresponding to the value p at time t equals zero right and so you, you th this waiter starts with his plate there in some angle and the bottle standing right and what happens well as long as the waiter moves around slowly so as long as the, the the movement of the plate this p of t is a slow change then we would all expect the bottle to stay standing on that plate even if the orientation of the plate changes a little bit right namely the the position of the bottle follows the instantaneous fixed point of my dynamics okay and of course you expect this to hold provided the, the, the rate of change is slow enough, right? If, if, if the waiter, you know, uh, goes into the wall and, 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 and this plate moves too quickly, then of course the bottle will fall and I will go to another, I will not stay close to the instantaneous fixed point of the dynamics, okay? Right, so that's, that's the principle, right? And again, there's various concrete situations where you can where you can you can prove it and and so this talk will be about uh, about quantum mechanics uh, and so I let's let's be a little bit more precise in a quantum mechanical setting. So here you know the 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 quantity that changes is a, is a vector in a Hilbert space that I will still call phi of t. The dynamical equation um, is Schrodinger's equation. And again, so it's Schrodinger's equation, but a driven Schrodinger equation, or at least, you know, before I even drive it, there's a Hamiltonian here, which depends on a parameter or a family of parameters, P, right? So, so you see H, so phi is a vector in H, uh, in the Hilbert space H, HP is a, for, for each value of P is a, is a self-adjoint, is a self-adjoint ap operator actually acting on H. And, you know, a typical situation which goes in this setting, usually by the name of a Fowler's pump or quantum pump, uh, is, is the following thing. So, you know, in part of the of the picture is that you have some uh, stationary states, and here you will think that H p here for each value of p is a, is a, is bounded below and has at the bottom of the spectrum an eigenstate. So let's let's call this this normalized eigenstates omega p. Right, so each value of p, I have an, this eigenstate, this ground state will be the ground state omega p. Right, I will assume, and this will be a rolling assumption, that there is a spectral gap above the ground state energy. Right, and and so uh, you know, if you have an idea of a pump, uh, you you have the idea of something that is cyclic, and so I will when I talk about the Thales pump or a quantum pump, I imagine that I have a given path like this. I have a given path of parameters in, you know, this manifold of parameters, and it's a closed and smooth path. So you see, I could, I could, I could imagine that it's a parameterized path. So I have a, a map from zero, one to, uh, to the manifold M, right? So if, if I want to go back to this picture of a waiter, you know, it's just moving his plate slowly, but in a, in a, in a periodic fashion. Okay. Right. So that, that would be what I call a, uh, a quantum pump. Right. So, as I said, there's a natural geometric picture that comes with it. Let me be a little bit, uh, a little bit more precise here again. So, so uh, as I said, the, the adiabatic setting is that I have this family of Hamiltonians here, depending on a parameter. And what I do is I make this parameter time dependent itself. And I will make it so, so that the rate of change of the parameter is slow. 
what does that exactly mean? Well, mathematically, it just means that the physical time here, t, in fact, you put a small parameter epsilon in front, okay? And so the, the, the change from s equals zero to one, you know, in order to do this change from s equals zero to one, if epsilon is, is very small, that means you will do that in a time t, which is very large, right? So you will do the, you will, the rate of change will be very slow. And so if you do this, this time change in Schrodinger's equation, you see now it's an equation in the parameter s, and of course you get this, this small parameter epsilon here in front, right? So all I'm trying to do now is to solve that Schrodinger equation with an epsilon in front, right? And of course, I'm not the first one to, to do that. I mean, the, the pioneers uh, were, were born in Fock, uh, you know, 100 years ago. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe just before, just now, I think just after the Spanish flu. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the person I think who made, for the first time, a, a very general and mathematical theory was, was Cato in, in, in 1950. And really the statement of the theorem that you can prove if you have if you have a spectral gap is exactly this right that the this is the solution of this schrodinger equation here right that as as the parameter epsilon goes to zero this solution for every time s converges to the instantaneous ground state omega ps okay again this is provided i start and i should have said here you know something there that i start in the instantaneous ground state at s equals zero p at p at p zero right right so this is exactly what i said right the the the, the driven solution the solution of the driven schrodinger op equation converges to the instantaneous uh, uh stationary state omega ps okay now you see once you have this in fact the dynamics ha has become very simple. It has become a very geometric dynamics because, because really what is the setting? Well, I try to illustrate this uh, here uh, at the bottom right. So in fact, what I have, I, if I go back to this picture of a, of a pump, right? I have this, this path, right? So I, I change parameters along the path. So I change my Hamiltonian along the path. And at each point along this path, I have, a, let's say, in, you know, for simplicity, it's not necessary, but for simplicity, you have a unique ground state. So you have a one-dimensional vector space that you can, you can paste at every point along this path, right? These are these lines that I, that I, uh, that I, that I tried to, 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 to put here. You know, above, above each point, I have this vector space, right? And really, my, the interest about this is that the solution of the Schrodinger equation just reduces in the limit epsilon goes to zero to well what is called a parallel transport so it is just a map from every uh, every one of these fibers here onto each other right I, I tried to explain this here right so it has become the, the full schrodinger dynamics has become completely geometric uh, and i think the first people to to you know to to realize this at least formally is were barry and then uh, so michael barry and barry simon a little bit later on in fact, just at the same time. <clears throat> okay, so, so in the limit epsilon goes to zero, Schrodinger's equation really just becomes a parallel transport, okay, along these fibers here of these, of these ground states uh, spaces. Okay, does this imply that the solution is also cyclic? Yes, the solution will be cyclic because, you know, in the limit epsilon goes to zero, at time s equals one, I would have gone through the whole loop and I will be back to, well, you know, I have to be careful. I will be back to a vector in, in, the, uh, in that same one dimensional vector space, but I can have picked a phase, right? Right, that's what, that's what parallel transport will do. You, you know, when you come back to the same point, you may have changed phase in this situation, right? Because I have a one dimensional uh, vector space at each point. So it's not, it's not, it's not strictly cyclic, it's cyclic up to a phase. Okay. Good. Uh, and by the way, this phase will play an important role. So, so you know, once, once I have, yes. So should we make any assumption about the dimension of the ground states? So, so you see, so here I, I, I said, uh, let me go back. I said uh, somewhat explicitly, although it's not necessary that I have a, 
written, or I didn't write it, in fact, but I have a unique, a unique ground state, right? You could also imagine that you have a, a finite dimensional ground state space at each point, and uh, that, you know, if, if the gap remains open everywhere, so this, this dimension remains constant along the loop, and I will, in fact, I will put myself later on in that situation. Here, I had a one-dimensional vector space for simplicity. It's not necessary. So, you know, now that you have this geometric picture in mind, so you have really, it is a, what you have is a fiber bundle, right? Then in fact, you know, the following things are a little bit less surprising. So this, this you know, I, I have this slowly driven physical system. If you think of this physical system as, as being a system of electrons moving in a, in a piece of condensed matter, then, then this time evolution may, may move the electrons around and therefore transport charge transport particles and therefore transport charge. And so you can, you can apply that kind of setting to, well, a physically concrete system, which is the quantum Hall effect. And you could, it turns out that this geometric picture also has a physical interpretation. In that particular case, I will come again, I will describe the Hall effect a bit in more detail later, but I can already tell you that a, a geometric notion, which is the adiabatic, you know, the curvature associated to my to my uh, fiber bundle, which is called the adiabatic curvature, equals the whole conductance in the right units. And as a consequence of that, once you realize that this geometric object is also a physical object, uh, you know, this is work of Thales originally, of Avron and Seiler, the whole conductance is a, is a quantized quantity. So it's an integer again in the right units. You know, there's, there's in fact various realizations of this, of various uses of this geometric picture. More generally for, for quantum pumps, you know, the charge transport is, you know, over a cycle is the integral of, of the adiabatic curvature. So it's, so it's more of a winding number in some situations. It's, uh, you know, there's many names, I guess the, the previous ones should be there, plus Brouwer, Graf, Probably many people uh, contributed to that. So, but all I want to say here is that once you have the geometric picture and you realize that it has a connection with a physical quantity, then this kind of statements that you know charge transport is quantized become a little bit less surprising. Now, there's still a bit of a problem uh, that I you know some so far completely ignored, and it's the it's really the large volume limit. Imagine, you know, I talked about electrons in a metal. So we are in essentially in a thermodynamic situation where there's many, many systems. So let's, let's think of it a little bit more, but where does adiabatic, so there's a question and I don't see the full question. Where does adiabaticity arise in the quantum Hall effect? I mean, what is, yes. So in the quantum, I will come to that, uh, Neil and Jenna. The question is, where does adiabaticity arise in the quantum Hall effect? What exactly evolves slowly? I will come to that in a second, a more precisely. I have a slide on explaining this. Um, but let me come back here to the infinite volume. I want to finish with, with adiabaticity independently of quantum Hall first. So if I have now, you know, if you want many quantum systems here indexed by points on the lattice, for example, right? And here for simplicity, I think that at each point I have a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Let me think that I'm in one dimension, this is sufficient. And suppose that I do that kind of adiabatic evolution and that at time S I have a situation like this. So the, the instantaneous ground state would be, so I, you know, I put little arrows to represent spins. So it would, the, the instantaneous ground state would be all spins aligned down, right? Now, as we've discussed, if you do a, a slow driving, so at finite epsilon, but not you know, epsilon to zero, then I will have a little bit of an error. Right, so it, at each point, I will have a little bit of an error. You know, my, my ground set will be kind of, kind of on average pointing down, but not exactly. But if I look at, if I look now at the inner product between these two vectors, you know, and I really think that it's all, even if it were all just product states, right, then I would have here a product of things that are slightly smaller than one, right? So in, in the thermodynamic limit, where I have a large number of these, of these sites, then this inner product goes to zero, right? Because it's just a product of numbers smaller than one, strictly smaller than one. And so in particular, this vector cannot be close to that vector because they're essentially orthogonal, right? So that's, you know, sometimes goes by the name of the orthogonality catastrophe. And so a natural question then is to say, well, so 
what happens with the adiabatic theorem with quantized transport when you go to the thermodynamic limit, which is the right order of the limits. It's all a question of the order of limits here. The thermodynamic limit is first you take the large volume limit, and then you take the slow driving, the adiabatic limit, epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so I, I would like to say, try to prove an adiabatic theorem in that setting. So I will, of course, not go, uh, you know, in this talk in much detail, but, but let me briefly tell you how, how you do this. Well, the first thing, of course, is you don't want to compare states like this, you know, the, the full state, but you, you want, you know, not in norm, but you want to have a, a, weaker, a weaker topology, which just probes states locally, right? By this, so you just look at essentially at expectation values of observables that are localized somewhere. Right, so that's the first thing you want to do. Now you see, you still have a little bit of a problem because you have this long time evolution. So if you have systems that are really in interactions, then in fact, these, you, will, you will build up correlations between, between these sites and the correlations will in fact grow to very large volumes because you have a time evolution over very large times. So in order to solve, you know, to, to be able to follow this in details enough, you have to make sure that you understand exactly the, the locality of the dynamics that, that is, that is, you know, the physical dynamics. And one thing which you will need to do is to, you know, I told about parallel transport, right? Which is the map from the ground state at let's say S equals zero to the ground state as S equals you know, any other value of S, right? But, but of course, there's various ways of implementing this as a, as a unitary map, right? Because all I said is it's a map between two vectors, but, I, but a unitary is a unitary on the whole Hilbert space. So there's a choice. There's a vast choice of unitaries that, that map omega zero into omega s. And there's one which was essentially introduced by Hastings, uh, which does this in a, in a nice and local way. So it's, and when I say local here for unitary, it will mean that if you, if, if you look at its action on observables, if you take an observable A, which is localized, you know, here, let's say at the origin, then it's, it's you know, and, and you, you act upon A with this, with this U parallel, then, you know, this observable will still be localized essentially at the origin up to little tails, you know. Of course, there will always be, you know, a little bit of spread, but not too much. Okay, that's, so that's, that's this construction of Hastings. And as I said, because you have a time evolution over very large times of order epsilon to the minus one, in fact, you know, you kind of a simple first order perturbation theory in epsilon will not suffice. You have to go to higher orders. This is a bit of a technicality. But, you know, eventually you manage to prove uh, uh, this theorem here, uh, with, uh, which I did with uh, Wojtek de Hoek and Martin Fraas. And so, as I said, right, so here you, you look at the difference of two expectation values. One here is the expectation value of an observable in the solution in the driven state. So that's a solution of the time dependent Schrodinger dynamics. And you compare it to the expectation value of the same observable in the instantaneous ground state of the system, right? And you get a bound which is proportional to epsilon. It's also proportional to, you know, to properties of the observable. So you see, if you take an observable which itself would be, you know, very large, the bound becomes very bad. But you imagine that you only do that for observables that are local, right? That are essentially, you know, over, if I think of a, of a lattice system, just over a few sites, and then it's fine. What is, what is uniform in the, in the volume is the constant C here. So you see, I can take the, the the full volume can be infinite, essentially, or at least arbitrarily large. Uh, the error just depends, you know, on the on the observable, but not on the uh, on the on the on the large volume limit. So you can prove this for for quantum spin. So it's all for the lat on on a lattice, right? So you can prove this for quantum spin systems and for uh, for lattice uh, electrons. Uh, this was uh, work by uh, Monaco and Teuf. Okay, so you see, the point of this theorem is, yes, you can again prove an adiabatic theorem in a setting where you have many interacting particles, whether spins or, or, or electrons, you can do both. So there is an adiabatic theorem for interacting uh, systems in, in the large volume limit. 
Uh, okay, I, so I understand that uh, this theorem has some assumptions which you're not going to state. Right. Uh, so, you know, one important one which I state is the smoothness of the Hamiltonian. Uh, in fact, if you want the, uh, the, the bound as I give it there, uh, the, 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 this, Hamel, the, this map must be C D plus one, where D is the dimension of the system. So the dimension comes into the game. So that's in fact the most important ass assumption I would say. It, it needs to be a local Hamiltonian. So really you, it, you know, this, this H is a sum of, of local interactions. Let's imagine them that they are uh, finite range. You can, you can go a little bit beyond, but not too much. Uh, as I said, you assume that, you know, to get the, the statement as I as here, that you have a spectral gap above the ground state energy, which is uniform in the parameter S and in the volume. That in practice is the hardest, uh, the hardest uh, assumption to check. And I think I've listed essentially all assumptions that are needed now. Okay, um, good. So, so let me come back now uh, to, to, the, uh, to the whole effect. And we'll, we'll see here whether the small driving comes yeah, into the game. Question. Yes? What, what, what about these uh, higher order perturbation uh, things that you mentioned? Right. Uh, so they are well, not in the assumptions, they are there in the proof or? Uh, uh, absolutely, they are, I mean, they're in the, you see the trace of them in the assumption because you see, if you, if you look at the standard adiabatic theorem as proved by Cato and many others afterwards, you need a Hamiltonian here, which is smooth. So that map would need to be C2 or a little bit less in fact, C1, I think C1 plus alpha uh, to, get, to get this bound, to get exactly this bound, right? With, a, with, a, with an order epsilon here, right? So here we need D plus one, uh, so that is, uh, that is where you have a trace of it, but indeed nothing is left apart from this in the statement, right? But, but, but it's in the proof. You see, fundamentally you have to compensate for the fact that for very long, you know, these are, these are, this is a time evolution for time of order epsilon to the minus one. So if it's, you know, if you, if you have, these systems have ballistic growth of perturbation, so so, you know, if you, if you make it, you start a little perturbation here after a time of order epsilon to the minus one, the perturbation has spread over a volume of order epsilon to the minus D. And this, is a, this is a dangerous thing as epsilon goes to zero. So you have to, to be able to, to control that kind of errors and that's how you have, that's why you have to go to higher order perturbation theory somehow. So here HS, so the question is, is HS, is this an unbounded operator? So the concrete setting that I have in mind is a finite volume lattice system where at each site you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So HS on a finite volume is bounded, but it's bounded by its, you know, its norm grows proportionally to the volume. It's an extensive observable, right? So since I want to take the large volume limit, it becomes a very, a very, very much unbounded operator. Right, but I do like that kind of proof. That kind of statement here is made at finite volume with bounds uniform in the volume. Okay, so let me come to the whole effect. So there's many whole settings. Here's one of them, uh, uh, <coughs> which is which lies on the uh, cylinder. So imagine they have a, a, a gas of electrons. You know, hopla, sorry, moving around. Uh, moving around on the surface of this cylinder. This cylinder uh, is, you know, there's a, a perpendicular magnetic field out of this, uh, out of this cylinder. And so you see here, I have a phi of S. So I've had a phi of S before, it's, it's the same. So here, the physical meaning of this phi of S is that I have a, a magnetic flux that, that goes here through this uh, cylinder, right? And Faraday's law, uh, of induction tells you that if I have a changing magnetic flux here, it will induce, so it's equal to an electromotive force moving, you know, you know, in a, uh, in a you know, across, you know, how, how should I describe this? There's, there's a, well, it's, it's best drawn, it's here, right? It's this E. So a changing flux, in, you know, produces a, an electromotive force here, 
And in the presence of a magnetic field, which is perpendicular to it, that will create a current, which is called the whole current. And that current here in this setting, you see, will go along the direction of this cylinder. In order to measure this current, what will I do? I will actually just put myself at the line across the cylinder and just count the number of charges that go in front of my nose, right? So there's this fiducial line, it doesn't really matter where it is, but I will count the number of charges that go across this line in a given, in a given time, right? Uh, and so, and so here's, you know, what is the conductance? Well, it's the ratio of the current you produce by the electromotive force, right? So it's J, it's down here, it's J divided by E. And it turns out that, you know, you can measure this. Of course, this is a famous experiment uh, in, of the, the year I was born, actually. Uh, and you get that this whole conductance down here is an integer times, uh, you know, in the right units of E square over H. All right. So here, you know, what will be, to answer finally uh, Nilanjana's question, what will be the slow driving here? It will be this. I will increase this, uh, this magnetic flux very slowly. And the slow increase of the magnetic flux will move slowly uh, particles here along the cylinder and in particular across the fiducial line. Good. So as I, as I also mentioned already, what I, what I will do from now is everything is in a finite volume setting. Um, so I imagine, in fact, you see my cylinder, of course you have to, electrons that have to come from, electrons have to come from somewhere and move, you know, uh, uh, here, they have to come from somewhere and move somewhere out, right? So one way, one way of doing this, uh, uh, oh, there's a, again a question, I didn't have time to see it. Um, uh, how do I get back to the, well, I, I saw that there's a question, but I couldn't see it, so I can read it. I can read it. Yeah. Don't we need a closed path to get the quantized effect? Yes, yeah, so it's very good. It's a closed path here because, uh, because in fact, if you, if you increase this by exactly one unit of quantum flux, so from phi increases by two pi, again, in the right units, then in fact, you are indeed in the setting of a quantum pump because one unit of flux does essentially, you go back to your, to your own system. I, I will again see, you know, say that uh, uh, in a second. The audience is too fast here. So I, am, I put myself in a finite volume. So, you know, my cylinder, I imagine it actually being part, you know, a small part here of that torus. It's a finite volume torus. I will imagine it to be arbitrarily large, but finite. And again, I will count the number of charges going in here across this particular line. Now there's, I have a Hamiltonian, which is parameterized by this magnetic flux. So it's H phi. And I have a ground state projection, which of course will also be parameterized by this flux. And because, you know, because again, this is magnetic flux, I will have a, I will have a, a uh, periodic Hamiltonian. So H at phi equals zero will be the same as H at phi equals two pi. Now, of course, I want to talk about charge transport. So what is, I need a charge operator. And I, I will have it, you know, if you think of electrons, this, you know, this would be the, the total charge is the number of electrons. So Qx here would be the number of electrons at every side x. Right? Again, you, might, you know, I, I draw a continuum torus, but it's all on the lattice. So the charge in any finite set z is the sum of the, you know, the number, it's the sum of the number of particles, you know, at each site within the set z. And an important thing will be that, well, my charge operator, is an integer. Okay, so my charge of, uh, sorry, my charge has integer spectrum, right? As has the fermionic number operator. So there's right. the question, it, it, what it is, is phi? Phi is the flux. So in this particular setting, phi is the, is the, you see it's there, it's this magnetic flux. And I will change this magnetic flux and change in flux will produce charge transport, right? Okay, so I have, because you know, I'm, I'm in a setting I described in the beginning, I have a notion of parallel transport, which I will call, so U, so here this U parallel without any, any S here is, is the parallel transport of a whole cycle from zero to two pi. And so it will map P onto itself again, right? It's, a, it's a, the, the projector onto itself because it's a ground state projector two pi, which is a ground state projector H equals zero. 
And what do I want to do? I want to compute charge transport. So of course, the first thing you would write if you want to talk about charge transport is this. It's, you look at, let's say, the charge in a half system. And you look at, well, the, you know, the charge operator after parallel transport minus before parallel transport. That's the total change of charge. But if you're in a situation where you have charge conservation, you know, the whole charge that goes in here will go out on the other side, right? So you, what, what you will have is that this operator, in fact, factorizes into a sum of two contribution, one which is, you know, the charge going in across that first fiducial line minus, and another contribution, which is the charge going out across the other line. This is this T plus. And really, if you want to give to get anything meaningful, you don't care about what happens on the other side of the universe. You only care about what happens across this particular line. So you just want to look at this, this particular contribution, T minus. And with that, you can indeed prove the following thing. So I will put myself in a situation where, uh, so in, the, in, in, this, in this particular context, I will have exactly that H0 is H2 pi. That was a question that was asked to me. Yes, uh, you can think that H, H of pi, it's not exactly the case, but H of pi, is just a gauge transformation with e to the i phi q. And q having an integer spectrum, e to the i times 2 pi q is just the identity. OK. So here's a, here's, a, here's a theorem. I imagine that I have a ground state projection which has finite rank p uniformly in the volume, at least for volumes large enough. And then I can prove two things, in fact. One is that if I took a look at this charge transported across the fiducial line minus, which is this operator here. Now, you know, look at, um, look at this trace here. Then in fact, I can prove that this is an integer. This trace is an integer. It's an integer up to errors. That's this symbol here. It's a, that means it's an integer up to errors uh, that decay faster than any inverse power in the size of the system. L is the size of the system, right? So that's one first thing. And if you want an independent thing, and that has to do with a very specific setting I had here, that if you look at, you know, you normalize this properly. So you normalize because P has rank, you know, capital P has rank little p, you normalize this trace. Then in fact, this object is exactly the quantum hall conductance. Again, up to two pi, right? And so again, all of this is up to the same type of errors in the volume. And so you see, all together, you show that you know the, the quantum hall conductance here is one of the p times an integer, so it's a fraction, and its denominator is given by the rank of the ground state projection of my system on this finite on this finite torus, right? So I, I insist now here, you know, this kind of quantization was well known for non-interacting electrons, and in fact, even for interacting electrons, but there was an, an additional uh, additionally needed assumption of of averaging, which I don't need anymore. So this proves quantization of the whole conductance. Uh, you see, again, in fact, it turns out that the first thing here, this quantization, in fact, holds for an arbitrary quantum pump. Uh, so, so that setting of a cyclic transformation suffices to have this quantization. And in fact, you can show that, that this quantity here is an integer, not only for parallel transport, but for any local unitary uh, that leaves the ground state P invariant, right? Uh, but I, uh, since, you know, I, I will not spend too much time on this. Let, let, let us focus on, on, the, on the whole effect. I, I'm slower than I thought, so let me not go on to non-interacting fermions where you recover things that you know. How do we see that? So quite, <laughs> I never have time to actually see these questions uh, on time. So Daniel, can you read that, please? I can read it. How do we see that sigma h is integer in units of e square over h? Well, you don't see it here, of course, right? I mean, of course, the whole setting, the whole physical setting, when I say, you know, the flux, for example, increases from zero to two pi, this is, of course, in the right uh, physical units, right? The flux has, it has some units, so it's all in the right unit, these magnetic units. So that, you know, two pi is actually, uh, you know, so that, you, you know, when I write, when I write, uh, 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 where was that? When I write this, this equation, the two here 
it's of course in the in the good units of e square of h but you, you of course don't see this uh, from these slides just a, a quick remark here again so here what is the driving in my system well it's the flux it's the change of flux so it's the it's the derivative it's the derivative of uh, of the flux but because it's the derivative in time again and i'm in rescale time s so you get an, a factor epsilon in front and so you can prove something else that's joint work with, with uh, the same two co-authors and marcus lange that in fact you can also look at this charge transported not by parallel transport but in fact by the true driven schrodinger equation right so at finite epsilon this is u epsilon this is really the you know you really do this physically and you can show that again this is the whole conductors in fact to all orders in epsilon and if you if you go back to this this is in fact to all orders in the driving so you see in general you think of the conductance as a linear response coefficient right so there would be correction of higher order terms in the driving and it turns out that 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 in this quantum hall setting it's not the case the the linear response if you want is exact is exact to all orders in perturbation theory again something which was known uh, uh, there's, a, there's a paper of klein and seiler it was known again essentially for non-interacting electrons or if you add this uh, this additional uh, uh, averaging assumption good so i have I have 15 minutes. Let, let me try to explain one aspect, one technical aspect of, of all of this. So, uh, so I will. It's a, I'm switching gear a little bit, and I I look at a map. I, I'll come back to my, you know, I'll, I'll land on my feet. But let me take here this this. So I I, I think of it, I have an observable on my on my lattice, and I and I map it using this. So I take my observable, I evolve it in time with my just you know this is that you think here at fixed parameter right but i evolve it in time and i integrate the, whole, the resulting thing against a, a weight function w if if this weight and I, i'll choose a w in a, in a very specific way it's bounded it's integrable and it's free transform is like this it, it go it decays that exactly like one of xi at least for absolute values of xi that are larger than the spectral gap of that of that hamiltonian right you see, once you realize that this here is, a, you can actually write it as, you know, a function of taking the commutator with the Hamiltonian, like this, you see that this property that W of Xi is one of Xi shows that in fact, you know, this map is exactly taking the inverse of the operator taking the commutator with the Hamiltonian, this add H, right? So if I take an observable O, it is exactly equal to this map applied to O commutator with H, right? You see, if you look at this equation, that's what I mean by I is the inverse of taking the commutator with H, right? Now, of course, you know, I have this here, this condition here only for, for values, you know, for parameters, you know, outside of the gap, which means that you, you should see, you know, you should see here only matrix elements from, you know, across the gap, so to say. And so this equality is true only for operators that are off diagonal. That I you know, try to explain this here. It's for operators that are off diagonal with respect to this ground state projection. So that have entries only in this block and in this block. P perp is one minus P. Okay, so for operators that are zero here and zero down there, I, I can exactly invert, to, I can invert the operator of taking the commutator with H. Now this has lots, this map is a very useful thing. First of all, it, it generates parallel transport. So if I now have a, a, a parameter dependent Hamiltonian and I have a parameter dependent uh, P here, right? I can look at its derivative. This is this prime. This is the derivative with respect to the parameter P prime. Now, because it's a, it's a family of projectors, this, these projectors are always off diagonal with respect to themselves. So I can, I can say that P is I of P, you know, P, P prime is I of P prime commutator with H. This is, this is the, the identity I had here at the bottom. So having this, you know, then you're done because, uh, because you see, you see P and H commute. So if you take the derivative of, P H equals zero. That means you know P prime H uh, is H prime P. So I, I do this. I do this here, and then this operator of I is just take an, an evolution with H that so commutes with P 
So I can move it back here. And I get an equation for P prime. You see, I get, a, I get, the, I get the, the, the Schrodinger equation, if you want, for the, for the projector P prime. So this map A, I is very useful because it gives me a natural generator of parallel transport. In fact, you can apply it, you can use it, not apply it, but you can use it for any operator A, not necessarily off diagonal. So if I define this A bar as A minus this, well, what do I do? I take off the off diagonal parts of this operator A, right? Because for the off diagonal part, this is equal to the off diagonal part of that. So A bar is in this picture here of, uh, in this picture there, a bar has something only here and there, but I've killed off the off diagonal uh, entries here. So for any, ob for any observable, A bar is diagonal in, uh, in P, if you want. In particular, it leaves the range of P invariant, okay? And there's another thing which is- I'm sorry, uh, th yep. this depends on the choice of the function W. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so, so uh, what what is the role? I mean, what is the freedom of of the choice of that? Well, you see, there's there's a there's a big freedom somehow inside the gap, but I but I fixed I, you know I fixed the Fourier transform on on the whole parameter values of psi larger than the gap. So that is fixed, and that is what is important to ensure that property here. For the rest, it doesn't matter, and you use the freedom that you have of W here to make it decay fast in, in real space. So W of T decays, decays fast as T goes to infinity. Okay. But for, the, for this property here, all you need is that. So that's the only thing that I impose here uh, that is strict. Okay. Okay, good. And, and the last property is that it's local. So, in this, so if I apply I to a local observable, I get something which is still essentially localized, has the same support as the original observable. I have to, I'll have to go a little bit faster. So, you know, the point is I want to apply this to charge, to the operator of charge, really. And so I suppose that I have a charge conserving Hamiltonian. Of course, if I'm transporting charge, I'm interested in, in things that are that, you know, where charge does not appear and disappear. So it's a charge conserving a Hamiltonian. And one way to phrase this is that if you look at the, here, the commutator of the Hamiltonian with a charge operator on a, on a, on a you know, the charge in a finite set Z, then in fact, this commutator is supported on the boundary, right? Because, because this commutator is really the operator of change of charge. And if you have charge conservation, this has to be supported on the boundary of the, of the, of the system. So, if I apply I to this, it's an operator which is still supported along this boundary. And, but now you see Q minus this, this is exactly what I had before, is an, is, an, is, an, is an operator which commutes with the ground state projection. So out of, you know, Q, the charge on a, on a half, you know, remember it was the charge on a half system. Of course, that doesn't leave the ground state space invariant, but this modified Q, modified only at the boundary, does. Right, so I, in a sense, Q will have some fluctuations ac across the boundary, but by adding this 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 operator K, I kill off this this uh, these fluctuations, and I get an operator Q bar, which you know which which in particular leaves the ground state space invariant. Now, uh, I'm running a bit out of time, but but anyway, I think it's an important thing that if you, now there's something nice about this Q bar. I take this exponential at two pi here, right? So Q bar Z, you see, Q bar is this, this difference here. And Q itself is just a sum of, think of that as the number operator at each site, okay? So it is, you can, you can again split that as the charge on the boundary, you know, make it a slightly fat boundary and the, char the charge inside. Because they are supported different sites, they, they commute and I can, I can factor this exponential. So there's a part of the exponential which lives at the boundary and a part of the exponential which lives here only in the, in the interior of my domain. But you see, this has integer spectrum. So the exponential at two pi is just the identity. So this actually is zero. Oh, not zero, but one, right? And I'm left with, in fact, this operator. The, so this exponential of Q bar 
is this. And the important thing is the operators you see here live only at the boundary. So in fact, this operator, I like to think of that as a loop operator. While, while here it looks like it's, it would be supported on the whole of the, the, the set Z, in fact, it turns out it's supported only on its boundary. So it's a loop operator, right? And so you see, this is, this is, these are exactly the kind of loops that I used, in fact, before. If you go in the proof of the of the uh, of the quantization of the index, in fact, you you apply this, you know, to the charge on the half system, the charge of the half system. Again, you can modify it here and there to make to make it a Q bar, which leaves the ground state space invariant, and so it factorizes into two, you know, a unitary there and a unitary there. And you can convince yourself that both of these unitaries still leave the ground state invariant. Okay, so and I have now I have loop operators associated to these non trivial loops here on the torus, you know, these, these non contractible loops. In fact, more than being non contractible, they're not boundaries, you know, both together are the boundary of this set gamma, but each of them individually is not a boundary of a domain. This will play an important role, right? So I'll have, uh, I'll go across. And instead of going here through the details, because time is a little bit short, I will just say what happens. So you can associate to any, you can draw a loop on the, you can draw a loop on, on your torus. And to any such loop, you can associate a loop operator, as I just described, right? So, and now there's two situations. Either this loop is exactly a boundary of a domain, in which case, I've just said, you know, in which case the, the loop operators actually happens to be trivial on the ground state space. So it, it really, you know, as, a, as it is written here, V alpha on the ground state space is proportional to the identity. It's a multiple of the identity. However, for those loops that are not boundaries, so those, in fact, on the torus, those non-contractible loops, then, in fact, the corresponding loop operator still leaves the ground state space invariant. But it may be non-trivial, so it may, you know, if there's more than one state, it may, it may map one of the ground states into another ground state. This is only true for those loops that are not a boundary of, of a domain, right? And so, in fact, you can rephrase the, the index theorem that I presented at the, at the very beginning. You know, if, of course, it's not obvious here, but I'm just telling you that you can rephrase this in this, in this kind of algebraic fashion where you just consider two, the two, in fact, the only two non-trivial loops on the torus, one here. And you see this one, if you want, is, is you know, physically real, you know, physically corresponds to this flux, that I, the, the changing flux. There's another loop here, which is the fiducial line across which I will measure charge transport, right? You can associate the loop operator to both. And if, if you make this combination, uh, if you make this combination, if you, of these four loop operators as acting on the ground state space, you can prove, and this is in fact the whole proof of the index theorem, that this is a phase, uh, and this is a phase, and this phase is exactly this Q over P, this, the value of the index. Right? For some of you may recognize this as what's sometimes called the rational rotation algebra. So on the ground state space, you have these non-trivial unitaries uh, acting and that have these commutation relations, right? So that's another, if you want, this is just a rephrasing of the index theorem that I did, that I presented before. And I will just finish now with this and go one step further. I talked about closed loops, but you see these loops are obtained as an exponential of, of a, essentially a charge, which is a sum of terms, right? So I can also just cut the sum and associate, you know, and associate operators to open loops now, to open, not open loops, to open paths. Right, so I can, I can pick a path gamma in my system. You know, all of this is of course in a discrete setting, right? So I pick a path gamma, associate to it uh, 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 an operator V gamma and let that act on the ground state. Because it's not a loop anymore, because it's not a loop anymore, V gamma will not leave the ground state space invariant. So this, this state phi that I have here is in fact an excited state, right? It's not a ground state anymore. Now you see, you can, of course, this state depends only on the position of the, the extreme points because 
if I took another loop, you know, the change between having this path and another path that would go here would be a closed loop, and closed loops are trivial on the ground state space, right? And so this is really a, a state of a pair of excitation, one living at one end, one end point, and the other at the other end point of the path. And now you can ask, well, okay, so I, let me think of these things here as particles. Can I, what are they charged? And you can do this, right? You look at, you take a large square, a large circle, large square around one of them, and you look at the expectation value, this is here, of the charge operator in this excited state, and you compare that to the expectation value of the charge in the ground state omega. Well, you know, this is obtained by, you know, this is, a, this is just a little calculation. You recognize here, in fact, exactly the, the index. So you get as a, as a, you get as a charge of this particle here, a fractional charge. This is this Q of a P. It's the same as the value of the fractional conductance that you can see. So we recover this. This is something that, that you know, something that is known from the Laughling argument. I mean, Laughling did, and there is, there's even, even been experimental measurements of this fractional charge. These two other authors are two different experiments made that claim to have measured in a quantum hole setting the fact that indeed the, the excitations are, have carry a fractional charge. The other thing which you can do with these, with these, with these uh, excitations, you can take two, one here and another one there, and you move this one around. So you move this one around, you come back to the same, to the same position. And so you can, you know, you think of doing that, right? So you get again, a berry phase. So you know, in this setting is often called the, a braiding and let me try to explain this quickly so you see I, I want to explain how this v alpha phi is, is is exactly equal to this well you know phi is v gamma so alpha is you know alpha is this closed curve so v alpha acting on omega is nothing so i can put it for free then i put v gamma on this is so these three things together are my state phi then i act upon it with v alpha it's here and then i add again nothing right it's these are unitaries but now if i put the brackets right i recognize here exactly the product of four unitaries that i presented before and i know that this is exactly this phase and i'm left with the phase times v gamma v gamma omega it's the initial state so i you see by moving one particle around the other i get a state which is the same as the initial one up to a phase right and so you know, people would say that particles having this with a non-trivial phase, these are exactly what, what are called anions. And again, this, it was known that, that systems such as the quantum Hall effect, there are physical arguments, uh, have that their elementary excitations are such anions. You know, I think when Fröhlich are part of, uh, you know, of the people who, who, who understood that uh, in, in the past, and we recover this in a, here in a very explicit fashion, and really, it's a, it's as it, it's as a corollary of the um, of the proof of this index theorem. All right, and with this, I, will, I would like to to close and thank you know thank first of all my collaborators on this: Wojciech de Rock, Martin Fraz, and uh, Alex Bolz and Marcus Lange. The last two ones being postdocs. And I would also like to thank uh, you know the people who taught me m many many things about about this this subject. In fact, I should in particular note that Yossi Avron had given a, uh, a talk or a lecture in Les Ouches many, many years ago with the same title of this. Um, so, you know, mine was just a little extension of what he did at the time. And with this, I think I would like to, uh, I would like to stop and thank you again for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. So let me unmute everybody so we can uh, clap. So I'm going to mute everybody again, but if any, if people have uh, questions, please ask questions. So either you can unmute yourself. So Sven, please unmute yourself right away. Uh, yes, it's done. Yes. <laughs> Very good. So, so questions can be asked directly to, to Sven or we can, uh, you can also use the chat. Let's see. Question. Yes, Sven, uh, thanks yes. for the nice talk. 
Um, I had a question. So do you always get a vegan onions or? Yes. So uh, we always get the bean and onions, which is a little bit, uh, which is a little bit sad, I would say. Uh, but it, 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 there's it, in, so in this whole setting, there's really no space for anything else. In fact, uh, you cannot, you know, the, part of our assumptions, uh, in fact, enforce that what we will get here is just a number. We will never get anything else than a number. So it is absolutely unclear at the time how non-abelian anions would arise. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you know, I would like to insist that here these anions are not put in, in a sense, from the start. They really come, all you have is something which is very natural. It's, you have a, a charge, which really could just be the number of particles in a fermionic system. And out of this, you know, very natural charge, which has integer spectrum, you, you, you see that the elementary excitations, or some elementary excitations at least, are uh, abelian anions, yes. Mm -hmm. So you recover the structure that you find in models such as the Tori code model or the, or the levin wen model. Uh, but I, I, I would say that this arises in a much more natural and uh, much more natural microscopic fashion. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, thanks. So there is a useful historical comment by Charles Goldin in the chat. I'm not going to read it, it's a bit long. Um, okay, I'll have a... But uh, everybody should read it. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Or further comments? No. So let us start again uh, for Sven. I'm and I'm going to do the recording now.